By the tender mercy of our God, the dawn from on high will break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. And so we say our prayer of approach. Let us pray. Jesus, our risen Lord, reveal yourself again to your doubting people. In the community of the faithful, give us the peace of your presence. As we face an unbelieving world, assure us again that you have chosen us. May we know your life in us, then reborn in the spirit, all who doubt and disbelieve may come to faith and hope. And in our lives of loving goodness, you may be praised for all time. And so we say the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our first hymn is... Uh, my favourite, and was Charles Wesley, who was the greatest of the English hymnographers, his favourite too. When I survey the wondrous cross, and sin.
Our scripture reading is from the Gospel according to John, chapter 20, and reading from verses 19 to 31. Late that Sunday evening, when the disciples were together behind locked doors for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them. Peace be with you, he said, and then showed them his hands and his side. So when the disciples saw the Lord, they were filled with joy. Jesus repeated, peace be with you, and then said, as the Father sent me, so I send you. He then breathed on them, saying, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive any man's sins, they stand forgiven. If you pronounce them unforgiven, unforgiven they remain. One of the twelve, Thomas, that is the twin, was not with the rest when Jesus came. So the disciples told him, We've seen the Lord. He said, unless I see the mark of the nails on his hands, unless I put my finger into the place where the nails were and my hand into his side, I will not believe it. A week later, his disciples were again in the room and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them saying, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach your finger here, see my hands. Reach your hand here and put it into my side. Be unbelieving no longer, but believe. Thomas said, My Lord and my God. Jesus said, Because you've seen me, you've found faith. Happy are they who never saw me and yet have found faith. There were indeed many other signs that Jesus performed in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. Those here written have been recorded in order that you may hold the faith that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that through this faith you may possess eternal life by his name. Thanks be to God for his word to us. Amen. So we say our prayers of intercession. Let us pray. Eternal God, we come with our, with our risen Christ to join our prayers to his for all your children in the world. We pray for your children in this age when seeing is believing, when mystery is no longer held in awe and inexpressible, unutterable truths are seen not as true but as irrelevant when for so many the limitations of time and space represent the beginning and the end of everything and death concludes life in negation. So that, I, so that illness and pain are meaningless torture and present wealth and happiness become life's most urgent requirement. We pray that the immense love of Christ in all its crucified helplessness may come home more and more to politics and commerce, to day-to-day -day relationships, and to all the hopes and fears of this, this human race. We pray that your joy which is at the heart of all creation may manifest itself 
in nature and in human experience, even in the dark, painful and destructive times and places. We give our thanks for the life and work of Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, for the many roles he held and the important influence he had here in Britain, in the Commonwealth and on the world stage. And we ask for your blessing on our Queen Elizabeth and the royal family at this difficult time. We pray that the Church and all Christians may so live and bear witness that in life or death your goodness may be proclaimed so that more and more people may follow after you and knowing themselves claimed by your persistent love may work for justice and peace until the whole creation is reconciled and all things are brought to fulfilment in your glory. Amen. And so to our sermon, see my hands. Doubting Thomas, I don't know about you, but I always welcome him back as a dear old friend on this Sunday after Easter. The other disciples have seen Jesus. Their lives have been turned upside down. All that week, they must have talked about it. Talked about it as people who have shared a, a profound experience. Whatever you believe about Easter, this is true that the disciples of Jesus had such powerful experiences of his presence with them that they were sure he was alive. Not just resuscitated so that things would go on like they had before and one day he would die again like the rest of them, but alive in a whole new way and with them so that nothing would ever be the same again. Thomas wasn't there. Thomas didn't experience it. Thomas, no doubt, became increasingly irritated by their talk. What they were claiming was preposterous. He must have thought he was the only sane one left. Until the day that he too experienced the living Christ there beside him. It happened for Thomas too. There is such grace in this story. Grace not only for Thomas, but for us. We who, like him, were not there for Easter Day. Jesus rebukes Thomas gently for not having had the faith just to accept the story his friends were telling. But it isn't a big lecture. Instead, Jesus says, look, see, touch me. It's all right, touch me. Take what you need in order to believe. This is for you, Thomas. This is so that you can believe too. I don't need to tell you that in this culture of ours, we're surrounded by Thomases. Seeing is believing. I often hear it said that there is spiritual hunger out there, people seeking for something greater than themselves to make sense out of life and connect them to realities beyond their five senses. Perhaps it's true. Every now and again, you bump into something that makes you wonder. Princess Diana's funeral, the great wave of hope that washed over everybody at the millennium, 9-11 and the upsurge in church attendance. But day by day, I meet a lot more people who are politely indifferent to our invitation to faith. 
we are talking about things we can't prove. If we could prove them, that would be different. But in the meantime, a lot of talk, a lot of folk prefer to keep their distance. Thank you very much. The message of this sermon is very simple. In a culture full of Thomases, we need to offer something that people can see and hear and touch. It isn't enough to tell our stories within our own four walls and expect anyone to, re to, to respond. That would be nice. As Jesus said, blessed are people who can believe without having seen. But for many, it isn't like that. And as Jesus loved Thomas enough to give him what he needed to catch on to the truth of resurrection life, so he loves the people with whom we come into contact, you and I, day by day. I'm sure you've heard the quote from St. Teresa of Avila, Christ has no body now on earth except yours. Yours are the eyes with which he looks out onto the world. Yours are the hands by which he reaches out in love. Yours are the feet by which he goes to those in pain. Today, I simply want to remind you, we are the body of Christ. And if he is to appear to the doubting Thomases of this world, with that grace that says, here, look, see my hands, touch my side, leave your doubt behind and believe, then we are going to have to do it. Not alone, of course, he's with us. I'm certain of that. But people will not see him unless they see him through us. Churches these days do a lot of work in the community. A survey in London, replicated now in several other parts of the country, indicated that in 2012, the churches were running over 4,000 community projects, from night shelters for the homeless to contact centers for non-custodial parents and their children from lunch clubs and toddler groups to youth groups and unemployment projects. It's reckoned that these, these projects touch the lives of over half a million people. This is part of who we are. To our credit, overall we do this work with no strings attached. Very seldom in a project run by our sort of Christian will you experience any pressure to talk about Christianity? In fact, in many places, we consciously play down the religious side of who we are. After all, we don't want to make anybody uncomfortable. We don't want to put them off. Especially, we don't want to offend people from another faith group, Muslims or Hindus or Jews or Sikhs, who might want to take uh, to use our services. They are welcome. We want them to know that. But we are very discreet about our faith. And people do come. Only there's a problem. They come and they go. And not only do they not feel pressured into becoming Christian. In a surprising number of cases, they don't even realize that the building they're coming to is a church. It's obvious to us, but people don't see them. Perhaps a plaque on the wall or a notice board near the gate. Or if they do, they don't make the, con the connection between the Christian faith the church is about and the service to the community that goes on in the buildings. They don't see the hands of Christ. Humility has been our defining virtue for a long time as Christians in this culture. 
I wonder whether God might be calling us to something else now. Those people from, another, from other faith groups are the first to look at us in bewilderment when we hide our light under a bushel. Offend us, they ask. You thought you might offend us if you stood up proudly and said that you were Christians. Why in this world would that offend us? It turns out that we are the ones embarrassed about religion, not them. How can God be glorified unless we are joyful up front about the fact that we are, uh, what we are doing, we are doing as believers. How can people know Christ's hands through our hands unless we are willing to speak his name? What started out as humility and sensitivity to the feelings of others has become selfishness, albeit un unintended. People need Christ, and all we give them is ourselves. Christ comes to doubting Thomas with such love. Thomas, Thomas, he says, why do you have to see? Why, can't, why couldn't you just believe what the others told you? But Thomas did need to see. And Christ showed him. We too were surrounded with people who won't be able to believe until they've seen for themselves. Let's continue to show them. Amen. And so our second hymn, or final hymn, number 600, Christ is the world's light. Number 600. for our final prayer and dismissal let us pray all glory be to you God and Father of Jesus Christ you have won a victory turning tragedy into triumph fear into joy 
night into day. May this Easter news so enliven us and inspire your church that all life may be reverenced, all green shoots of hope nurtured, all victories of service celebrated. May we follow your risen sun into danger and delight, sharing the Easter work and announcing the Easter story with Jesus Christ our Lord and our dismissal. May the life of God eternal fill us. May the joy of Jesus Christ risen surround us. May the power of the Holy Spirit unite us this day and throughout Eastertide and always. Amen. <laughs>